Welcome to Shook Coverlet, where we squeeze the bigger picture out of literature. I'm Adrian Fort. And I'm Dalton Gentry. And we're here for the third of a 16-part series as we journey through it, as we just float along through the text. Just keep floating. Just keep just floating. Just keep floating. So this is Stephen King's It. Yes. And we have a little bit of a recap. That's right. Ben Hanscom is on a flight and begins to flash in and out of reality as we, the humble reader, are thrown... Until, into, multiple different time streams. The bells ring. It's June of 58, and young Benny Boy is receiving his report card as the school year ends. He can't help but notice that Henry Bowers isn't getting his. Ben had refused to let Henry copy off his homework, and he feels that Henry may have failed the year and will get held back. Bad news for guilty Ben. Ben continues to wander the town, muttering his love for Beverly Marsh while Henry and his gang pursue. They find him at the library, a sanctuary for our young Ben. However, a poster in the library reminds Ben of yet another, seriously, another, missing kid in town. Ben remembers his curfew. Ben's mother, Arlene, keeps a close eye on him and gave him a fancy watch to make sure he's home on time. Now, Dream Ben, Ben the Younger, falls asleep and has a dream within Old Ben's Whiskey on the Red Eye dream, where he remembers he saw... Oh, what was it? Pennywise the Clown, complete with red balloons, yay. Ben returns to the library, but Henry and his gang of ragtag 1950s stereotypes pursue him this time. They corner Ben, cutting him with a knife, but he again escapes death. It visits him again in the form of a mummy this time, and soon another visitor appears. Good old stuttering Bill. Turns out his friend needs an inhaler, or he may die. And now... It's Bill's turn. Old Bill is also flying. Old Bill remembers the bike that young Bill once had called Silver. Hi-ho! Yeah, you get it. So, ye old Bill and young Bill's flashback remembers a time that Ben watched over his good buddy Eddie while Bill retrieved the inhaler. And then the kids decided, hey, you know, let's build a dam. Which got Bill thinking about poor Georgie. Back at home that night, Bill enters Georgie's room, and it makes it very clear he hasn't forgotten the delicious appetizer that was Georgie as well. Now, follow this one here. Ignore everything that just happened. Newsflash about the death of Edward Corseran? We'll go with Corseran. Uh, which gets hardly breathing Eddie thinking. As we know by now, thinking is bad, so boom, it in the form of a swamp monster. But, forget that, let's immediately talk about Mike. Mike goes to visit the old ironworks building, and he finds it as... Birds. This time. Birds. Dare we say... That all these children are somehow connected through it? And dare I say we go a bit further and say it is preying upon the individual fears of each child? Just saying. All right, Adrian. Where shall we begin? So what this is, is June of 1958, chapters 1 through 6. Which, which, let me get the exact numbers again. I noticed this as I was doing the scheduling. Uh, it is chapters 4 through 6. Oh, wow, is it really? Yes. Oh, wow. Yes, a little, mis uh, a little confusion there. It starts with chapter 4 because the first three chapters yeah. were up here. So chapters 4 through 6. It's a very strangely formatted book. Really, uh, well, it's a million pages long, so you have to do something. Yeah, there is a through line to it, but it is difficult. And that is one of the things that um, the more Stephen King that I read, the more I realize I'm not sure if I love or hate about him. But he'll start with a story, tell you the story of that story, get back to the story, tell you the story of what happened there. That's actually one of my points this week. Yeah. He does that. He's all over the place. We go from present day back to past. We go from present day to dream. We go from present day to past to dream. It's all over the place, but he does it well. You know what's going on and you know where you are. You're never actually lost in the text. You never know at what point if we're dreaming or not dreaming. You never know if we're in, you know, uh, 20 years ago or the present. 
you know where you are, it's just all over the place. Yeah, um, so King is a masterful storyteller. Okay. I will not say he's a masterful writer, because I don't know how many times through these three chapters someone's arms pinwheeled, but um, he is a master storyteller in that you always know where you are in his convoluted texts. Okay. Though I will say, I think I mentioned last week, I tried to read this when I was in the fourth or fifth grade, and it lost me. Okay. I knew, I, you know, I could read the text. He's, he doesn't, he uses some big words sometimes, but you're always able to figure them out with context clues, no it's matter where you are as a reader. For sure. But when I was a less experienced reader, it lost me. Okay. Uh, so it is much easier for me in adulthood to appreciate King because of, as, as a writer as well, I enjoy, I really, really enjoy that he can take you somewhere completely different and then put you right back where you were. Okay. It's almost like time travel. That's fair. Uh, and, and Stephen <clears throat> King says that writing is like telepathy, which it really is, right? So it's like time travel in telepathy. And that's fair, and I think he's successful in it. I mean, we start off this week's reading uh, on the plane, of course, with Ben, and then we go immediately back to childhood, and it's a very smooth transition. We know what's going on. That's great. What loses me so far with this is just absolute character overload. There are way too many characters. There, there's quite, yeah. I have no idea what kid is which. I have no idea, like, who's the bad guys this time. There's too many characters. And then we're starting to introduce the parents as well, as they were kids, the kids' parents. There's too much. See, I've never had problems with that oh in this text. Oh, my God. Uh, character overload, sure, but I've never lost track of things, which is incredibly interesting because not only are there a thousand characters, but they're all named Stan and Eddie. Bill and Eddie. Eddie. And there, there's no there's no interesting names. I think there's thirties there's thirty Ed Ed and Eddies in this, right. and like it's killing me. And there's <laughs> there's such plain names. Like here, one thing I'll never forget is when we started this, we had to go to the bank because we were setting up a, a Patreon and a and an AdSense account, mm -hmm. and Dalton and Adrian. And our bank guy was named Chandler. And it must have been the only time in history that a Dalton and Adrian and a Chandler were ever in the same place. Yeah. And they were all white guys. That's fair. Um, but this text does not benefit from interesting names. No. Even Pennywise's real name is Bob. The names suck. They yeah. do. They do. And they get confusing to me. I, I'm glad you can keep track of them. Uh, but I... It may only be because I've read... What the hell was that? I don't know. A bug or something flew in my mouth. Uh -huh. um, but no. Uh, I, I constantly have to stop and I have to say to myself, you know, which kid is this? Is this the tubby kid? Is this the kid who wheezes? Is this the kid who stutters? Uh, which is great that they all have some character flaw that you yeah, can identify. You've got to, you've got to remember that. They've Fair all enough. got something very... I won't say wrong with them, but some, some weakness to themselves. I'd like to get back to that, but I think you've got a point. You've got your book open. Um, this is a scene that just crushed me. Um, we are with Ben. Okay. And Ben is the, the kid who really doesn't like the fact that he's overweight. Yes. And he's with his mother, who really doesn't like the fact that she's a single mother, because she feels overwhelmed. You can sort of get that from her. And then we get this scene. <clears throat> Which, by the way, she's worried she's a bad mother, which must be one of the most awful feelings in the world. Okay. To, to feel like you're a bad mother. Fair. Or a bad parent in general. And he knows it. This is when Ben is a child. So hear what I'm saying, she says to him. If I set this table and pour your milk and see that there's no Ben washing his hands at the sink, I'm going to go right away to the telephone and call the police and report you missing. Do you understand that? Yes, Mama. And you believe I mean exactly what I say? Yes. It would probably turn out that I did, did it for nothing if I ever had to do it at all. I'm not entirely ignorant about the ways of boys. I know they get wrapped up in their own games and projects during summer vacation, 
lining bees back to their hives or playing ball or kick the can or whatever. I have a pretty good idea what you and your friends are up to, you see. Ben nodded soberly, thinking that if she didn't know he had no friends, she probably didn't know anywhere near as much about his boyhood as she thought she did. But he would never have dreamed of saying such a thing to her, not in 10,000 years of dreaming. She took something from the pocket of her house dress and handed it to him. It was a small plastic box. Ben opened it. When he saw what was inside, his mouth dropped open. Wow, he said, his admiration totally unaffected. Thanks. It was a Timex, which with small silver numbers and an imitation leather band. She had set it and wound it, and he could hear it ticking. Geez, it's the coolest. He gave her an enthusiastic hug, hug and a loud kiss on the cheek. That is a crushing scene because she's afraid she's a bad mother. She's afraid for her son. He knows she's afraid she, he's a bad mother. He also knows that he has no friends and she thinks he does. And he feels as a child. And w King's really good, I think, at writing children. Yes. Like at no point do these seem like adults, but they don't seem too childlike either. Correct. Um, he feels betrayed because she doesn't know he doesn't have friends. She's just assuming her son is out partying it up with the boys. Well, in the condition he comes home in, I would assume so, but we'll get back to that. Yeah, and he uh, he's at the library. Yeah. Uh, it is heart-wrenching, and I do agree with you that Stephen King is very successful in writing uh, through the eyes of a child. Uh, but never making them seem too childlike, no. while also never making them seem questionably adult. Which is, that's a that's got to be a tough line to toe. It's a fine line, for sure. And I think he's successful in it. There is a little bit of a suspension of disbelief with this. And that comes to the point of just like, every one of these kids is beaten to like an inch of their life. Or stabbed. And like it's just fine. And never as a child was I stabbed. I'd be like, you know what? We should build a dam tomorrow. That'd be fun. Are you serious? Yes. Were you stabbed as a child? Oh, many times. Were you? Prodded. Well, apparently shot. I had the wrong kind of childhood because, like, that's the one point here that it just kind of throws me off. I'm like, where are the parents? <laughs> Granted, they don't well, care because half the kids are dead already and they're just like, that's yeah, fine. Well, but it's also weird because I think that the. You're five years younger than me, right? I'm 29. Yeah, you're five years younger than me. And I think that those five years must have been very big years socially. Because this, these were my summers. I used to run all over the block, all over the town. That's fine. Foot. I used to do that as well. I used to ride my bike all over the town. Never got stabbed. Well, but you never fell off your bike and got roughed up? You get roughed up a little bit, but, like, the kids are getting stabbed. They're not going home and telling their parents getting they got stabbed. Beaten. You wouldn't go home and tell your mother someone stabbed me? Who stabbed who? What are you talking about in particular? Someone got, I think it was Ben, got a knife pulled on him. Oh, he got his, yeah, he didn't get stabbed. He got scratched with a knife tip. You wouldn't tell your parents that if somebody pulled a knife out on you and stabbed you? I don't think so. I totally would. Like, that kind of, that draws the line that's there. Where that's, the where, line where, that's where the line is drawn. I'm spitting all over you. you. Excuse me. all over me. I had a it bug in bug. my mouth. Yeah, I had to get it out. Excuse me. Uh, but no, like, it's just ridiculous to me. It's like, they, they literally took a knife to the kid, and he's fine. And, like, he's covered in blood. At one point, I think he said, like, you could he could feel the blood, like, pooling around his underpants. Like, it was leaking into, like, his shorts. Yeah, because he, he cut his initial in his... And, like, he just runs off into the woods and sleeps it off. Well, no, so I think what's going there, what's going on there, and I was prepared for this because I figured you would have that as a critique. What's going on there is either he had an adrenaline dump, it, and you've had adrenaline dumps, right? Maybe not. Maybe that's the reason I just... If you've had an adrenaline dump, sometimes what can happen is you get real tired real fast. Okay. So it, he either had an adrenaline dump, and he's, he's an overweight kid, so... Fair. All the running he was doing, all the scattering he was doing, all the fighting he was Preaching doing... Preaching to the choir. Um... It could have been an adrenaline dump and he passed out. Or, I think what's likely to have happened there, and this, again, written in 83, I believe, 85, something like that, they wouldn't have really known the science of yet. 
but we're finding it out rec recently, and it's crazy how often things like this get into text before they get into science. Could have had a concussion. Fair. At this point in time, you called it getting your bell rung. Hell, through my time in high school, yeah. it was called getting your bell rung. Okay. But it's a concussion. So you get concussed, and then you pass out. And it doesn't, like, I told you about my concussion, right? Yeah. Didn't happen immediately. I got my bell rung, got up, went back to the huddle, cursed everybody out, got the play called, turned around to go back to the line of scrimmage, hit the ground. Coach says it's good to bleed from the ears sometimes. Yeah, yeah. It's fine. Um, um, but here, it, just hypotheticals I'm playing with here. This is, of course, my first full read-through of It. Uh, I know the book is different from the movie. There's something going on here, and I think it leads to the power of Pennywise more than just he's the killer clown who preys on the children of the town. Uh, and we're going to use the term clown loosely because we're starting to see he embodies other things. Anyway, there's got to be some kind of power. Maybe we'll call it some kind of psychic distance that he has, some kind of psychic power he has over the town. It is completely unreasonable this town would never investigate all these kids going missing. It is completely unreasonable that these kids would just pass out in the woods and just, you know, be fine after they got stabbed. He I wasn't think stabbed. He was totally stabbed. There was a knife drawn, there was blood. That's a stabbing. No. That is totally cut. a stabbing. Well, they cut him. It doesn't sound any better. I think it's Pennywise. I think it's the pull that Pennywise has of this area that for some reason it's kind of turned these adults into this uh, blind eye, if you will, where they're not noticing what's happening. And therefore, they just don't care. But for some reason, the kids are all like in this nest of just bad shit. I have no other way of explaining that. Something bad is always happening. Yeah. You may get beat up once or twice in a lifetime. These kids are taking a beating once a week. I think, again, that you're talking also to the difference between times. It is. Maybe because... I'm not an 80s child. Maybe that's why I'm so sensitive. Also, I just need a good stabbing. Uh, I'll give you one if you'd like. But there's also, back in the, I mean, this is 58. So you're also not talking about as weaponized a society. Fair. Right? Anytime anyone, people don't get into fights anymore. When was the last time you heard about a bar fight that didn't involve a gun? Fair. It doesn't happen anymore. Back then, people got in fights. Hell, back in the 90s, people got in fights. You would hear all the time about Charles Barkley. You know Charles Barkley. I do. Six foot eight. He was 330 pounds during his playing career. I believe 330, but would get in fights in the bar, Can threw somebody through a window because of it. Those things don't happen these days. Okay. People get shot. So it's that's one of those micro changes, I think, that it, it's, it's a micro change because it's just the introduction of one more element. And everything has changed. All right. Right? All right. You sound unconvinced. I'm you don't unconvinced. remember kids getting beaten up left and right when you were in, in school? No! What year did you start? So you started school in 95? Sure. I would have been five years old. I, I don't know when I started kindergarten. When Nin did kindergartners start school? Probably, not. yeah. Probably 1995. No! I never recall kids just getting beaten up. Really? This never happened, man. Really? 100%. They're like, again, I'm, I'm from a small town. I am. Okay. So when you say this never happened, you mean in your life or you don't think this stuff ever happened? In my life. Okay. Yeah, no, I, I'm sure it's things like this happen. Not to this degree. This seems a little excessive, but I get we're trying to prove a point here. Um, but no, this never happened in my lifetime. Yeah, it's in my neighborhood, there were, when I was when I was that age, there were gangs of children that would roam around and just beat people up. No. No? This never happened. Never. Never. This is just bizarre to me. This is bizarre bizarro world. And I think it's just a little bit overkill. I don't know, man. Um, it, I, it, I don't know. It seems to me like it seems to me like someone making sense of the way that things are, uh, uh, not someone making a dystopia of something that never was. I'm a sheltered boy. It's fine. I don't know what to tell you. I guess. So we talked a little bit about how each kid has a unique flaw so far. We're starting to identify these are things they're very sensitive about or things that could be life-threatening to them. We've seen Pennywise appear a few times now to the children. And he's appearing in different forms. I believe the first time Ben sees him, he's like wrapped like a mummy. I think that's how he described it. 
So I'm assuming... But don't, don't forget that Ben also referenced something there, didn't he? The balloons. No, no, he, he referenced the mummy. He referenced the movie, yes. the so, Boris Karloff. I'm assuming that uh, the way this is playing out here is the clown form of it is the general form of Pennywise. Because everyone's afraid of clowns. Everyone's afraid of clowns. I'm assuming he is going to basically prey upon their weakness. Which is brilliant. It's good horror. It's the horror of not only the unknown, but the unknown is going to feed upon your fear specifically. It is the horror of the individual. Okay. Which is one of the things that in Dance Macabre, uh, Stephen King really goes into with horror in that horror... Um, oh, golly, I wish I'd been prepared for this discussion. There are three levels of horror. There is... Um, so... Let's skip that for now, but Eddie's, Eddie's asthma medication, we get a scene with Eddie's asthma medication, right? Okay. So the big thing with Eddie's asthma medication, did you catch that as, as, he was, as Bill was leaving the pharmacist? The uh, pharmacist says, what about the asthma medication? Isn't it a cheap version or something like Something about his mother. It's just tap water. There's no actual medicine there. Where the hell is my Don's macabre? I don't know. Um, so is Eddie's mother basically a hypochondriac? Well, is Eddie's mother the only one who's a hypochondriac? Go on. Eddie certainly has to have that medication, doesn't oh, he? Fair. Well, I mean, I wouldn't say he's a hypochondriac. If you well, grew up thinking you needed this medication, it's not like you're... Yeah, but that's the whole thing about being a hypochondriac, <sighs> is that nothing is really that bad. Okay. So he gets that medication, doesn't he? He does. And what happens? He was on the verge of death. Correct. Fine and dandy. He gets that medication and he's fine and dandy. Okay. So it is, pardon me, it is his belief in that medicine that makes the bad thing go away. Correct? Okay. It's a funny thing, isn't it? Okay. His belief in the medicine that makes the bad thing go away. Which implies that what? It was all in his head and he had the power to end it anyhow. Correct? Okay. So is that we're looking at overall then, that this is basically uh, just the childhood fears? Is that the overarching theme of this, uh, 200 pages into it? It seems to be, doesn't it? Because especially when we're getting back to, um, we're getting back to each of these children has grown up to perpetuate their childhood. Okay. Beverly grew up to marry an abusive man. Okay. We got hints that her her father abused her in her uh, in her chapter as well. Correct? More than hints, I'd say. <laughs> yeah. Um, God dang it! Where is it? I don't know. Do you have anything any anything to add to that argument? Uh, not not particularly. And I, it is going to be interesting to see if. And it's hard again to separate because I've seen the movie. I, I know some things from the movie. I know his asthma is going to come back. Right. It's going to come back into play, but it's going to be interesting to see if King plays into that a little bit more. Uh, I assume when Bill returns, he's going to start stuttering again. I'm kind of curious to see how it's going to affect Ben, how it's he going to affect He even started others. stuttering on the plane, remember? Fair on enough. The, on the plane back to uh, the Northeast. So is this going back to your childhood fears? Is it the things that basically you had forgotten as a child? You had forgotten that stutter. You had forgotten it. Do these things come back to you? Is that what we're getting at here? Do you have anything that haunts you from your childhood? Not particularly, no. Not particularly? And nobody beat me up as a kid. It's fine. You didn't have roving bands of marauders in your neighborhood? Apparently you did. You had gangs of small children. But no, I had no issues as a child. Well, um, I don't must have like... been nice. Must have been nice. I, I don't like deep water. And that's a childhood experience there. So I, yeah. I get it. It comes back into play. Yeah. So, um, it, not only that... If there is something like that from your childhood which you wish to suppress, you will suppress it. Fair. But you've got no power over it once it's suppressed. Okay. If it decides to reemerge, it will. That seems to be what happens with it, isn't it? Fair. It reemerges and then you have to deal with it. And if you don't deal with it, you don't hold that power over it. And the longer you suppress it, like the old timers in town, the longer it gets to grow and get nasty. Um, I can't find it in here. But he talks about the levels of 
there is shock. The the base level of horror is shock and awe. Yeah. Is when you see Hollywood that slasher horror. film. Yeah, it, it's Jason. Um, horror is something a little slower than that. It's something that develops. It is something going bump in the night that you don't see it. The third is like terror. Terror, yeah. which is turning the reader against his himself. Okay. Which is using the mechanism of the mind to terrify the mind against itself. Which is what Pennywise is doing, taking these individual fears and weaponizing them against the fearful. Okay. Um, I wish I could find it in there because it's it's put so much more it's so much better than that. Fair enough. Uh, do you have another point you want to bring up here? But the last thing I've got here is a bit of an ending point. Um, so I think it is interesting to look at this situation like nature. Okay. This is natural. These things happen because they have to happen. You have seven main characters. You have three bullies. Okay. You have one apex predator. Those bullies don't pick on each other. They pick on the seven main characters. Okay. That apex predator, he gets to pick on anybody he wants. Okay. So it is, it is interesting, I think, to look at it that way because what it does is it forces the reader outside of the text to say, okay, so Pennywise is the apex predator in... Uh, this town. Does every town have this apex predator? How many Pennywises is, are floating around out there? How many Penny Why? Penny Why. Uh, fair, fair. A lot, of, a lot of times you don't know about them until something comes forward, but there's always something dark and seedy lurking anywhere, honestly. So is this, So one of the things that Stephen King gets a, gets a bad rap about, oh, all of your stories take place in this part of the Northeast. I've never been there. I can't relate to it. Shove off, King. You've never you never heard that? No. Oh, yeah, this is one of the things that sort of people, oh, I don't like Stephen King. All this stuff takes place in the same town. Screw him, you know. Um, but is it just a reflection of the fact that he's writing the things he knows, but it is every town that has those problems? I'd say it is every town. I mean, there's, uh, Derry could be a town in, anywhere in the United States. It is just that quintessential small town. Uh, it's really irrelevant that it's from the Northeast. I don't know why that would ever be an argument. Because I think a lot like it's an argument against Faulkner. Okay. You know, yeah. it's Southern. Yeah. Right? Oh, I'm not from the South. It doesn't make sense anyway. Do those people really exist? Um, Kenduskeeg, Kenduskeeg, the Kenduskeeg River. Do you know what that means? I do not. Kenduskeeg is eel, weir, place. Do you know what a weir is? I do not. A weir is a trap for fish. Okay. So fish... Fish trap, place. Kenduskeeg River. Fish, fish trap, place. Um, on 256, well, 256 of my text. This is uh, Mike when he's talking about his father bringing out that Ford and he has to help him start it up every summer, every fall. The front half was an old Model A Ford car. The back end was a pickup truck with a tailgate, which was the remainder of an old hen house door. If the winter hadn't been too cold, the two of them could often get it start going by, getting it, by pushing it down the driveway. The truck's cab had no doors. Likewise, there was no windshield. The seat was half of an old sofa that Will Hanlon had scrounged from the dairy dump. The stick shift ended in a glass doorknob. Does that or does that not sound like our ragtag group of heroes? Okay. Every one of them. It, it is a it is a convoluted, ragtag group of weirdos. But everything serves a purpose. Stuck together to serve a purpose. Okay, that's fair. That's a good point to bring up. And if the winter wasn't too bad, winter is what in classic literature? Death. Death could also be death of imagination. Okay. So, well, it, it's definitely death, but I mean, if you want to extend that metaphor, death of imagination, death of imagination happens in your mid-twenties, going into your thirties, how old are these characters? Fair enough. Um, so if the death of imagination wasn't too bad, these characters can get back together after the winter and get it all kicked back up okay. with a plume out of the tailpipe. Okay. 
Uh, we'll see how it goes. Uh, the only thing I have here, just a couple last minutes, my biggest complaint with this is it's 1,200 pages. It's huge. It's ridiculous. Yeah, we are 200 and how many pages in? I, I have no 250 idea. 250-ish pages in. The strip cover lit is basically comprised of books shorter than this. But here's my problem. What do you cut? So far, everything seems to be playing its part. I could argue that we'd cut the interlude, but honestly, I, I think it's very nice. It's necessary. It's not necessary. It's not necessary, but it's nice. I enjoyed it. So this is the difference between a storyteller and a writer. Okay. Uh, yeah. A storyteller tells the stories he wants to tell. A writer tries to tell one story through its center. I would argue as well that's the difference between pop fiction and literary fiction. Very much, yes. Yeah. For the most part, yeah. So, we will be back next week. We will have part four of this. This is a 16-part series. 16 that what we've agreed series, upon. Yes. It's going to end up being a 30-part series, it is. But it will be part four, and that is just going to be the conclusion of this. I can't find it right now. Uh, chapters seven through... Through nine, right? Seven through nine, yes. Seven through nine of June of 1958 of Stephen King's It. So if you'd like to read along with us, make sure you pick up a copy and hit that subscribe button down below. We will be doing this until the end of time because it's never going to end. And make sure if you want to help us create more great content like this here on Strip Cover Lit and have an opportunity to read the original writings of Adrian Fort and myself, there's a link to, as always to our Patreon to be found in the description below.